YouTube, it's Brian. I just wanted to post a video from September 15th. The Minnesota Planet Tank Aquarium Group had their fall barbecue, and uh, Chris Lukop was the guest speaker. Um, so I've got about an hour's worth of his presentation here. Uh, my camera battery went dead, so I didn't uh, get everything towards the end, but uh, it's a really good presentation. Chris was a really cool guy to meet. He was uh, very personable, hung out with uh, all the people at the barbecue. So it was uh, just a really good day and a uh, fun time. So I thought I would share his presentation for those of you that are interested. Um, so check it out. Um, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do. Um, if you're looking for fish and shrimp food and Planet Tank accessories, you can check out my website, Aquatic Support Systems. Until the next video, thanks for watching. I'm going to start the live feed, so if I interrupt anybody with kind of questions, it's because they're shooting questions on, on Facebook too. Well, I'm, I'm hoping to answer a lot of questions that everybody also can hopefully listen to yeah. that. Yeah. And I want to give thanks, of course, to Denele. They paid the yeah. flight. Oh. Yeah, so uh, it's the company. I'm the creative director of Denele. And Shrimking is the, the line of Denele, so I am the person that promotes that, and it's my, my concept. Yeah, but it is more easy uh, to sell it because I'm not too good with numbers. I don't care in <laughs> too much in selling and these kind of things. I just want to do stuff. So at this point, I brought you some posters. Unfortunately, I ruined them because they fell off the plane there when I when I put it in the overhead vent there and they fell off down and was spread all over the airplane. People, what is that? Sure, can I yeah. <laughs> yes, you can use them. <laughs> the pound cost eight thousand dollars. <laughs> This is how I usually go, you know, I did it in Chicago, I, I escaped a little wine glass and I put shrimp, I had five in there, $8,000, and the people, <laughs> and I named it Shrimp on the Rocks. <laughs> so, here I have some posters, I will use you here as a, as table, yeah? So if you want it, they are for free, so I have the, the I ruined this a little bit, this is the newest stuff <coughs> from the most innovative breeders it's the shrimp I call it shrimp meister the poster because you all know Jägermeister right yeah. <laughs> that's why I said the Americans need to understand it also. <laughs> because I didn't want to put a Latin name because then eh? what is that so it's the shrimp meister poster who wants to have it can take it then I have the the wild type it's the volume one showing Caridina Logemani some uh, what is more here, some undescribed species, Cardina serrata, um, I have to see myself, Ginica, Ginica serrata, Sumatrensis, Gracili rostris, Serrati rostris, Simoni, Trifasciata, uh, Breviata, this is the actual Breviata, very interesting because for many years we thought that the bumblebee is the Breviata, so we have that poster, I have maybe two or three or four, yeah. Here's another shrimp meister, Jägermeister. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows that. In Germany, nobody drinks Jägermeister. <laughs> <laughs> we export it to you because that stuff tastes so ugly that <laughs> <laughs> no. And we will have a beta expo in, yeah. where is it? In New Jersey, Jersey right? New Jersey. Right? Yes, I have Same to book, book my flights. I'm, st I'm still without <laughs> flights. So we will have some beta and of course mm -hmm. it's the the shrimp uh, contest. You all are going, right? I see you all there. <laughs> Danielle will sponsor your flights. <laughs> <laughs> I have not said that, Danielle. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you come, we, we may, maybe give you a, a two dollar sponsoring for your uh, ticket. <laughs> <laughs> so there's also a beta poster. Then um, I made a poster some time ago of uh, Monica. You probably know her because she had a very new interesting shrimp. It's called the dancing man. Mm -hmm. You see this dancing man, the pattern? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's not, uh, it's not carved into the shrimp, it's real. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know that with koi sometimes they do that. Wait, really? Yes. That's they so cut. Awful. Yes, ask the koi, they will tell you. But <laughs> you know, they have the, that, the round, this round red uh, orange uh, dot on the forehead. And one of these koi cost up to one million dollars. So then we have crayfish freaks here because I'm a real crayfish freak. 
Fernando. He's sleeping. Sleeping. You, you sleeping. I gave you already a poster. Because after this trip, I'm going to Missouri to do some crayfishing. Oh. And relax a little bit after the stress here. <laughs> then I have the red and white poster, because red and white is my absolute favorite. It's all like shadow shrimps and what more. Yeah, it's mostly shadow shrimps. And then this is just a part of the posters that I have. I have like 20 different ones, but I didn't want to carry them all. This, <laughs> this is the general poster with, with, the, with the names, the Latin names. I hope it's the one. It's the old one, so it has not all the names, but it's good to look at. So <laughs> help yourself and take away, so whatever you want or need or... <laughs> Everybody jumped at once. <laughs> 52 years. Who heard of the company Denele before? Before today? Before today. today. Before today. Oh, before today. Oh. Well, let's say one third of you. And who knows Denele now? Everybody, Everybody should. But you, you know Shrimking, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Some idiot from Germany. <laughs> So I will show you something that really, really impressed me, and it's in the US. It's in Florida. It's one of my top five spots on the planet. I've traveled the planet. I've been in 85 countries. Of course, I toured with my band a lot, but also I went to places and to film and photograph. And this place especially, it's called Blue Springs. It's in Florida. It's, it is a, a spring, yeah, but it has... <laughs> Uh, a lot of nice water plants that you might know. Exactly, you know. And this is Louisville. <coughs> and you have probably um, uh, Sagittaria, Cusiana, and some Lepomis, some. This is Lepomis, for example. And I just floated there, and it was so amazing. I mean, <coughs> This is what I call natural aquascaping. Question, is this you filming this? Yeah. Wow, beautiful, okay. <laughs> Thank you. But it was easy because the place was so nice. So it don't took me too much effort. I just put the camera under water. That was <laughs> my job. <laughs> do you watch the camera or do you watch in front of you? Wash? Do you, do you watch the camera as you're filming or do you just no, let it? No, I, I do it all like I'm like a robot, I know where to put it. <laughs> Usually I put it in the place that looks best. <laughs> Normal. But look at that, you know, it's like, this is for me inspiration. When I see this, I want to escape a tank. I think so. I mean, it's, it looks better on the, on the screen here. You probably bought this in Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. And excuse me for the English because it's my fifth language, so it's not my, my best language. This is a, a big bass. I know that you guys like bass. Everybody's going fish for them. Poor guys, they will end up on the plate sooner or later. This is Sagittaria here. It, I think it's called eelgrass, if I don't. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. I mean, look at that, and you float over this. The problem is only, you have this kind of uh, little uh, reptiles there with two or three meters. <laughs> I got a question. What makes the space in the middle? <laughs> that's the, the people walking there. Is and then, it? They yeah, make one that's, trail and then yes. try to stay off the rest? I hope. Some yeah. of them don't care, but this is the main reason, because they get off their like paddle things, what is yep. it called, the little mm -hmm. paddle stuff? Kayak. The canoes, kayaks, and then they jump there and they ruin it, in fact. This is two years ago, and then came Hurricane Katrina and ruined it. And now the plants are slowly recovering, and you see, because of the agriculture, look at this, the, the Ludwigia repens, yep. because of the agriculture, um, you have a lot of nitrate phosphate, and that now, this year, when I was there, you saw a lot of algaes also. So, that is a little bit of a problem. You have other springs. I've been to Alexander Springs and other springs that are totally ruined now. The people like to, to, to uh, bath there and shower there or whatever, and they don't carry the plants. They just step on them. And if you step on some of those plants, plants is like Myrophyllum. I mean, look at that. You, if you walk in, 
in there, yeah. the people will say, yeah, I just go in there. Yeah, but in the moment you go in there, the plants will come up and then they float down. And I saw in the time when I was there, I saw a lot of big, uh, how you call that? Um, clumps. Clumps. Masses. Masses of plants just floating down the river. And I was like, hmm. another one gone. And if this goes the, through the whole year, at the end of the year, it will look all like that. So I told the rangers there, they should close this for public for a while so the plants can recover and then open it just a certain time of the day or so limited time yeah. and probably they will do it like that so this is florida i will show you another one are we are we live joe yes how many pe people are watching five six right now it is two Okay. So Eric <laughs> just literally got on. Eric Lucas, hi Eric. Eric, hey, he just Eric. got on, so he's uh, he's out at the other show. So okay, shrimp will come later. You have time to relax and uh, take <laughs> so a beer. Every we're watching on the other end. I yeah. assume. What are you? Where are you going through to film that? What t what page? This is on our Minnesota Planted Tanks Aquatics okay. Facebook page. So Denver is based in Germany. The headquarters are in Germany, and. Here I have, this is Florida Springs. This is like I, I marked the, the, my favorite places. So from here, I will take you to Colombia, Caño Cristales. We have, where are you from? Any Spanish people? Me? Yeah. No, I'm Russian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a Ruski. I know a couple of words in Russian, but I thought you are from Cuba. Yes. No, it's okay. At least it's good words. <laughs> um, Colombia. Hey, TV from Walmart. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is another place, a really, really impressive place. And I went there. It is. It was like three years ago or four years. I don't remember too many trips. But before that time, it was nearly, it was really impossible to go. So in the past, it was really dangerous. And they captured you, and they sold you back to the government. And if the government didn't pay, you had to stay there for 10 years, so, or even more. Or maybe you end up in the jungle as food for the snakes or whatever. I don't know. But for me, it always was a dream to go to this place because of one plant. I went there because of one plant. The plant is called Macarena clavigera. That's the Latin name of this plant. And it's not an algae, it's a red water plant. And it is just from that region. That means you find it in three or four rivers and creeks in that region, and that's it on the planet. And it was really impressive. What's the name again? You want that I write it down for you? <laughs> <laughs> Macarena clavigera. That's the Latin. And this is Colombia, Bogota. Everybody knows Bogota, right? And this is how the men work all day. <laughs> <laughs> and the women do the real work. But the men, it's like it should be, right? <laughs> My wife will kill me when I come home. <laughs> we, got, we have discussions about that because she's also alpha male like me. And this is what how they work in the night. Poor wife. <laughs> yeah, we were poor wife. And the, the, yeah. the cowboys, it's very similar to cowboys here, they do the same <laughs> stuff, but just, but look at that. And this is real, I didn't put any color enhancer or nothing, it is like that. And you know why? Watch the difference. Here is no tree, no shadow. The sun is super intense, that means even I, that I am really tan, if you go out, Joe, there, you will be red in half an hour. You will be dead after two hours, because then will, all, all your skin will be burned. Feed me to the shrimp. <laughs> Somebody wants that we hook up here all the time. What is that? And I called the, the scientists in Bogota and said, hey, is there any fish in there? What type of species? Any papers? No, there's no fish in there. Nothing lives there. I went there and I found seven species in that spot. <laughs> so that's why you should never listen to what the people... Better you be careful because... Also here in the US, let me stop that. When I went crayfishing, when, when you go out there and you talk to the fishermen, hey, is there any crayfish here? And then they will answer you, there's no crawdash here, we have to go for Louisiana. <laughs> and I jumped in, and then with one catch, I had three crayfish, you know? And so you better don't ask about alligators or snakes because they will tell you, there's no alligators. <laughs> 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 
more snakes, you know? <coughs> no, 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 don't land the snakes. And then you see the, the copperheads there and the moccasins. And so be very careful with when the locals tell you it's not a problem. <laughs> so, but Colombia, I found several species there. Of course, fish. The water temperature was 28 degrees Celsius. Yes, and you, rigorous. 28 degrees Celsius is very warm. In Fahrenheit, how much is that, Joe? It's like 80. I'm not sure, 84. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know that because in Russia you have also degrees Celsius. You are normal people, yeah? <laughs> I also found a new shrimp. And here, a pistogramma. I think it's McMastery, but I'm not a real expert. This is a female. And she was she didn't want to leave. And I was like, hey, great, I can film and photograph her. But then I saw that she, she picked up the babies. And that's why she came out. Mm -hmm. And this is the plant. And it can grow on rocks. It can grow in the gravel. And it looks like a little coral. And I tried to put it out. And it was so strong uh, attached to the rock that I really could not get it out. But look at this. The, the, the river was that deep. And in some spots, you have all different colors of this plant. And why? Because some spots are more in the shadow, others more in the sun exposed. And this is why the color is here different. We had some trees here. Has that plant been collected for the hobby? I did, yeah. And I hope to be a millionaire <laughs> next year. <laughs> but not enough. It didn't result because the plant we need really intense sun. I put it in my bag and after three days it was totally green. Mm. So it needs this intensity of the sun. And here we have an equidens. I think it's metai, but I like again I'm not the uh, expert <laughs> on the equidens. And you know what he does here? You see the eggs? Oh, oh, yeah. And I was thinking like oh, I nearly stepped on your whole family. <laughs> so that's the same plan. Ah. It's just because it's in the shadow. Wow. You saw the, the edges have been big trees and that's why the plant is green. So it's not nothing like some people say, must be something in the water. No, it's not. <laughs> it's just the intensity of light. Because otherwise they, the plant would be red everywhere. And it's totally logical that the intensity of the sun change the color of the plant. And also the intensity of the sun, if you have shrimp, also makes the color more dense. It's like if you go out to the sun, Joe, you will also get dark in, or red. But this is the reaction, and the shrimp have the same reaction. If you put very, very intense sunlight to the, to the shrimp, they will be, have a much better color. And that's why shrimp that come from Taiwan, from the ponds there, have a much better color. Because if you keep them with low light, the red, the yellow, will not be that intense. I mean, you can always use astaxanthin. Here I will make some advertising. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, I have now 20 plus year in experience in shrimps. And, or shrimp, right? It's not shrimps, it's shrimp. So the, that's also the reason why this food range exists, because I saw what the big companies did, from the Transterra and so on all these names and I was never happy because they made fish food and for for shrimp you you don't feed them fish food because shrimp eat differently and crayfish also for example for crayfish you need to have two different foods because juvenile crayfish young crayfish they feed the opposite than adult crayfish they have 80% protein in their food like little worms like all the small macro invertebrates and so on and 20% is detritus like leaves and all that stuff and in adult crayfish, it's just the other way around. 80% is detritus, how you call it, detritus? <laughs> yeah, this is American English, okay? But you know what I'm talking about. And just 20% is like dead fish or worms or these kind of things. So that's why you have to have two different foods. And with shrimps, shrimp is similar. Shrimp don't eat what fish eat. They are all, they are omnivores. That means they eat everything, but not all the time. Uh, protein or um, all the time uh, leaves or whatever. So um, in this, that's why we have the different kind of foods. Now, if you ask me, um, do they need all that stuff? No, what I recommend, 
I recommend it, yes, is that you have two or three different kinds that you, you can change it over the time. That's why, in my view, if you are a beginner, try with the five in one, for example, because here you have five different kinds and you can see if they like it, because shrimp are also very picky. For example, if you feed them a certain food over one year and then you try with another one, probably they will not go after it because they are so used to that that they stay with that. And this is, sometimes I don't know if any one of you made the experience that if you feed a new food, some populations, they say, mm, they don't touch it in the first moment. But if you continue that, they will go after that as well. So it's not that, I'm not saying that other companies doing bad stuff, I never would say that. There's companies that also do good shrimp work, but I think my advantage of it is that I am like more than 20 years working on shrimp stuff, so I'm pretty sure. Plus, I have been to the habitats of the shrimp, and this is something that others have not done. They know the shrimp from their aquarium, but they never have been to the habitat and really film a look and study them in the place, because I would recommend that if you produce food or have a shrimp line or what, you should go and take a look in the place because then you know what they go for and all that stuff. So we have here just, um, in fact, a little selection of what is out. The algae pops with two different kind of algae uh, for minerals, for uh, uh, different kind of uh, vitamins. And the baby, the baby food I use, for example, I feed also my nano fish with it because it's like a fine, uh, round uh, little powder. Can, it's a powder, yes. And do you know that, that baby shrimp are territorial? Did you know that? So if you have a tank like that, and you have a baby shrimp that was born in this place, he will not go to the other side to feed. No, he, if, if there's no food on this side, in that a radius of this, he will probably die and starve to death. So that's why it's important that the, the powder, it spreads all over the place so the, the baby shrimp have always food that they can find. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of baby shrimp don't come up, because feeding the wrong food. If you have in the past, we had these hard sticks that you, from Japan, I remember 20 years ago, they came and you even could not break them. And you put it inside of the tank and suddenly you had a pile of shrimp fighting for it. And this is very, con very counterproductive because you have the big shrimp that are in the middle, they're taking everything, and the smaller ones, they cannot get to the food. And that's why we have, for example, the algae pops, because it pops up and the shrimp can take, everybody can take a piece and just go leave and eat it in peace. That's why I am not pro uh, these, these hard sticks that you cannot break. I prefer that it pops up so every shrimp can go there relaxed and feed relaxed on it. And that's why pops or the baby, the powder, um, what more is here? Atiopsis, for example. You know that filter feeding shrimp, they sit in the riffles and they wait until something comes by and it, it sticks on their bristles. Is that right? Sticks? It, they, they catch it with their bristles. Right. Yeah. So, and plus they are in fact night active. Atiopsis, Ataya, you know, you call them uh, Nocturnal. wood, wood, wood shrimp, fan shrimp, and pipe. Uh, Vampire shrimp. <laughs> let's, let's cover him with a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> no, the vamp you call them vampire shrimp, exactly. These guys are night feeders, and usually they sit in front of the filter. And what comes out of the filter is nothing, because it's filtered, right? And then they starve. And then what they do, they go walk like this on the ground. And this is an unnatural behavior. So, in fact, that's why you should feed them separately. If you want to, if you take the decision to buy in your shop, if you go to his shop and buy some Atiopsis Ataya, you should know that they grow about this size, yeah, and that you have to feed them specially. The best is if you feed them in the evenings when you see that they sit in the fluid that comes out of the in the in the of the the filter. You know, they sit always there and put it just in front. You can use a tube, put the stuff inside and then it comes out just on, on the other end in front of their bristles and so you can feed them. You have to know this because I saw a lot of examples where the people, they didn't know that and then they had problems because they died or they had this unnatural behavior or go out of the tank or whatever. 
So, and also filter feeding shrimps, some of them like Atayo molusensis or Gabonensis, they go, the Gabonensis can grow to this size. So it's not for a nano tank like this. Otherwise you can turn them around once a week so they can look <laughs> to the other direction. Um, they, are, they are getting big. Plus they need some current in the tank. So for these tanks you can have Caridina, Paracaridina and Neocaridina. If you want to have filter shredding shrimp, you should have a tank at least like this with some power coming out. I got a question. So for like Neos or just Caridina tank, would you recommend feeding like a stick, like a complete or something, and then also powder daily or so you get the babies and the adults covered? Yes, the babies, if you have babies in the tank, they are my first concern. So I feed that first. Okay. And then if I see that uh, the adults still are going and nervous and walking around, I put some some sticks or pops in. Okay. But this always depends on my mood also, you know, I'm not, I'm not that good scheduled in these things. I just feed whatever I can grab, but always baby, if I have baby shrimps in the tank, then baby is always there. Because also for my nano fish, if I have uh, Daniel Margaritatus, which is called uh, in so the common name Pearl is... Hmm? So that's your Pearl Daniel? Pearl exactly, Daniel. that's the, the common name. You have them? Yeah, I do. Yeah, have and they are too. very shy. And they also like small food, so that's why I feed both. I mean, I know breeders who have the protein here, and they feed it to their guppies, and it works super well. I mean, but you know how people are. They, if they have shrimp, they want to have a shrimp on the cover. If they have fish, they want to have a, a fish on the cover. I mean, if you explain them for two hours that it works for both, they will be confused. <laughs> it, it is like that. And for example, here the yummy gum, you can attach it to a rock. And there was a video online of a guy who fed that, hey, and I thought that was war. I have never seen something like that. The shrimp went so crazy, I, I thought it's a battle from 1600 or 1100 where the Vikings battled the Saxons or something. It was like <laughs> And I could not believe it. I asked the guy, he sent me that video because I have to post that. I mean, but he also fed that for a longer time and the shrimps got used to it. And then when you put it inside, they poof, angry, mine. <laughs> So, so I knew it was a zucchini. Huh? I knew that was zucchini. A what? My shrimps. My neos, they love Zuc zucchini. Zucchini. Ah, okay. I had that also, the, the, the zucchinis, but not anymore because it, it got too much. And another important thing is the mineral and the salts, of course. For, for example, we have been in Sulawesi 2011. And from the, the first Sulawesi shrimp appeared 2007. I was the first who photographed and documented them. And of course, people, when they saw them, they, they wanted to breed them. But it was so difficult, and there was just two guys who succeeded breeding Caldina Voltareke. That's um, harlequin shrimp from Sulawesi. I will show you pictures in a minute. Um, but with the salts, I think that this is the most important invention in the last 15 years in, shrimp, in the shrimp hobby. Because with the salt, you can really make the water like in the lakes. And then the, even the difficult uh, a species start to breed. I mean, Cardina Denderly, that's the name, because Denderly sponsored the trip. Uh, we gave it the, the scientific name, we dedicated it to Denderly. That's one of the more easy to breed. But if you have Cardina Voltereke or Holtuisi or Lanceolata Glaubrechti, they are more difficult to breed. So for them, definitely you need the salt. And it's not because I want to sell you something or whatever. No, it's because simply they need it. With the bee salt, it's similar. I know that people succeed with breeding shrimp without the salt, but if you use the salt, it's much better. The salt is not for the shrimp directly, it is indirectly for them because it lets the microfauna grow. And that's what the babies, again, they feed on the microfauna as well. So that's why you put the salt in. And then the environmental stuff like little fungus and little, uh, creep, like little um, animals, microfauna they grow much much better because they feed on the salts and so again the shrimp the baby shrimp can eat that and that's why they will not have problems with growing and so on and that's what saves them so that's why i would recommend um since we're on that topic i do believe i ran across in the research isn't there a certain type that's got a symbiotic relationship with the sponges yes it's a caridina from lake Poso. And it lives in the sponges. The yeah, only problem is, I wanted to go there, but there has, 
they have big crocodiles there. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been there, and we jumped in the water, and suddenly I heard a guy from the other side of the lake in a little boat like that, all carved out of a tree, Boya! Boya! And I thought back then, I didn't speak Indonesian, so I thought it's like, hello. And I was ready. Yeah, yeah, sure. He said, hello, how are you? And the guy, uh, boya, boya. And he came like, tuk, 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 tuk. and he had an old Nokia cell phone back then. You know? Indestructible, exactly. And he showed me a crocodile of five to six meters on the picture and said, in this place, crocodile. And you know how I jumped out of the water directly in the boat, like a fish, you know? <laughs> so, uh, that's so, and in this place, especially, where is the spongicola? It's Caridina spongicola, it's like sponge, right? And in this place, especially, the crocodiles are really big. <laughs> and I, I snorkel there, I will show a video of that, but always like looking to the left, looking to the right. And in, once, in one moment, when, when I was snorkeling there and filming, there was a cloud coming, <laughs> and it was the shadow in the water, and I got <laughs> <laughs> you, Because you saw something moving, right? <laughs> I bet you they're sneaky like whale sharks too. Whale sharks? Yeah, whale sharks. There are no sharks. In fresh whale sharks are plant eaters. No, there's a certain shark that lives up north, and then I can't remember exactly what name it is. But it's, it's very. Not, not in Sulawesi, yeah? Only problem there is people that are a bit angry and. Well, alligators is. It's a little pet compared to these crocodiles. I mean, with a two-meter alligator, I would go there. But with a two, with a six-meter six. Well, you are Americans. You don't know what meter is. But let me show you. One, two, three, four, five meters. I don't know if you want to make this with a five-meter crocodile. It was the Greenland shark. That's what it is. They're so they're so slow moving. There's I remember watching a documentary on the scientists that's researching them. And he said there's been three or four different times where he wasn't paying enough attention and then just right up on him. Yeah, yeah, but this is a lake and, and it's inland, so uh, the shark probably cannot come there, but the crocodile stays in there. I'm going to bet you they're sneaky like that, sorry. That's why I don't dive in, in outside. I mean, one time I did it and I peed in my pants in the open water, and I will not do that again, honestly. A little bit more salty. Uh, no, I will not go to the salt water. It's too much, too much wild stuff out there. So let me show you a little bit of Sulawesi before I continue here. Because, like I said, I've been there in 2011 because there was a lot of stuff to discover. And I'm an explorer. I like to find new species. I like to go to places that nobody knows, like Florida. <laughs> so if you don't know where Sulawesi is, and these shrimp from there are really beautiful, so that's why I will introduce you a little bit. This is Sulawesi, and this was a, a former pirate island. Like 100 years ago, 150 years ago, a lot of pirates had their clubs there. Sulawesi, Celebes. So close to Australia. Well, this is like 8,000 kilometer, or like 5,000 miles. If it's close, you can try and walk there. <laughs> <laughs> Go with the bicycle, maybe. It's kind of like right in the middle between Thailand and Australia. Well, Thailand is here. That's Thailand, Borneo, Sulawesi, Java, Sumatra. This is Indonesia, and this is also Indonesia. It is Papua New Guinea. I worked here in this Timor, and here's Australia. Yes, and America, USA is there. Did you, did you point out where a lot of the Busa Palandra come from? Yes, I have been there. I can show you pictures and videos from that place. I have it here also. If you are interested in Busa Palandra, I will talk a little bit about it. It's here. I've been here okay. collecting, not collecting. I brought home two plants <laughs> because I am against this tourism that people go there and take all of it out that they can. And I don't want to support that. So I came home with two plants and we did genetical multiplication. We took just a little bit and now we have them from Denali and this is the way to go and not just go there and take yeah. all you can and sell it. This is, you have not understood protecting nature. This is my friend Kasten. He has been with me. We are in Sulawesi and this is like Poso. This is one of the big five lakes and we went there because of the shrimp of course and it was an amazing place. Unfortunately, they introduced some big fish, the flower horn. 
And this year, a friend of mine has been there, a scientist, and said, it's a pity, the shrimps nearly are gone. In some places, you don't find shrimps anymore. Because the big fish eat the shrimp. Mm -hmm. And this is Lake Poso. The water is very clear. It looks a little bit like um, the Caribbean and the lake. And very warm, 28 degrees Celsius. The parameters, I will put them in in a second. 27, 28 degrees is 80, 80 something. Yeah. pH 8.1. Wow. German hardness 5, KH4, uh, conductivity 109, and oxygen 7.5, uh, 7.05. And the, the lake has a good turnover. Even if you dive at 10 meters depth, that's about 30 feet, it's still warm. It's the same, nearly the same like on surface. So that means that the lake has a lot of movement. And that's good because then you have a lot of species that live down there. This is a crab from the genus Otuisiana. And here you see all the Tulomelania snails, the rabbit snails. They're all over. Some places are so full that you better don't step on it. Look, this is all the yellow rabbit snail. It's all at the juveniles there. Tulomelania drachenfelsi. We named it after a friend that donated some money. So if you want to have a, sh a shrimp or a snail named after you, we are open for donations. We can start with, for a shrimp for like $3,000 and for a snail, similar. Think about it. <laughs> you are rich, you can afford that. <laughs> I know that you are rich. Yeah. And we have, we see here a whale, you are right. The whale is coming in a minute. Ooh, really? No, you have been right. There it is. <laughs> are you alive? Are you alive? Still? Sorry, Carsten. It was not. I didn't make sense. Carsten is a friend of mine. So, and here have been shrimps all, all on this branch, full with shrimp. You don't see them because I'm too far away, but. How deep does that lake get? Uh, 500 meters. 600 are very ancient lakes, very deep lakes. And this is the shrimp that sitting wow. on the branches there. And this is a filter feeding shrimp, a caridina that has, you see? Because two o'clock in the afternoon, you can set the hour after that, the winds are coming and the lake starts moving. It's always like two o'clock. It's like, hmm? Tomorrow he remember nothing. <laughs> it's like, hmm? Well, he's going to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but don't, don't put that in relation with me, because then the people will think <laughs> the, 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 the guys fall asleep on my talk. <laughs> my name away from there. So, here you have a caribina that filter, is fi a filter feeding. This is just one of the very few on the planet that is like a tiny shrimp. It's like this size, and you see them and they catch the stuff, because when the lake moves, it goes like that, and I tried to take pictures, and I was like, going like <laughs> because it could not focus, and then my battery was low and gone. <laughs> so I did that for a while. Here, this is Cardina ensifera, another species from the lake, and this is in the aquarium, and as you can see, they have a very long rostrum, that's the nose, and this is one of the morphological features, how you determine shrimp and split the species from each other. You always go there, and say, okay, this is one of the features, let's count the little spines there. And then from 15 to 16, it's this species. From 18 to 19, it's this species. And of course, the, the color pattern is another uh, <coughs> feature in shrimp, how you can distinguish <coughs> between species. This is Caridina kerulea, which is a blue in Latin, because of the two blue spots. And also you can see a long nose, and this is the two spots on the uh, tail. fan, on the tail fan. Tail. Yeah. yeah, or uh, um, <coughs> oh. that's, that's the Latin name. And here again, the habitat of the rabbit snails. You know that, right? Yeah. It's Tulomelania, that's the Latin name. Drachenfelsi is the species name. Tilomelania is the genus, and Drachenfelsis is the species. And I think they are cute, right? I call them elephant foot snails. <laughs> or some people call them rabbit snails. And this is also a new species that I found in Lake Poso, in the same lake, 
there's like 40, 50 species, and most of them are colorful. This is a new species. And this one is also new. And here I found a new species because I was looking for these snails and I knew that they are in the depth of like uh, 9 to 10 meters. That's like 30 feet, right? So we checked the boat uh, from the guys from the town and we put a sink net to catch the snails. And we brought it up, put it on the table, and I saw in the sand, because the net went to the ground and grabbed the stuff, put it up. In the sand I saw something red and white and green moving. And I said, what the heck is that? Because I, I didn't know, I knew the Sulawesi shrimp back then. But then I saw, look at the nose. All other species have a long rostrum, yeah? This one, short and fat. And I was like, boom, new species. And the eggs are green. I've never seen that before like that. So here, and this shrimp, I will name it after my daughter. So huh? maybe you can name after your wife. <laughs> or your ex-wife. <laughs> so you can make her happy again. I'm joking. I'm joking with everybody. So, And this is in the same scoop. I had another new species. And first, first I saw, hey, beep, fuck. I broke the rostrum. <laughs> I have to go for another one because I broke it. Because you see, the rostrum is very short, the nose. And this is very untypical for uh, lake species. So I said, do it again. We have to go again down. And the guys from the, from the, that we rented the boat, no, it's 2 o'clock. I worked already a lot today. I cannot work anymore. I said, what? I mean, you worked for two hours. No more is enough for today. And I said, okay, let, let, I said, go to the coast, give me the boat, I will do it myself. <laughs> and, and then I went again down, and again it came up, and because it's kind of rough when you bring up the, the rocks in there and everything, I said, oh, again we broke it. And then I saw they're all like that. So for sure a new species, and it will be also described after the daughter of my friend that was with me. And this is how we go, you know, we brought this up, we put everything on the table, and then we go like, mm, what is new here? <laughs> and that's that's a really good feeling because you you find something actually that nobody's seen before. And this is Thomas von Rinteen. Is he's a scientist at the uh, University in Berlin Museum in Berlin. And here you have mussels, you have the snail. See, and these are the snails I went for, the orange ones, and I found them there. But I also found in the sand the two new little tiny shrimps, and they are like this. What is this? Half of an inch? Tiny. And of course, if you go there at night to check, the village will come and see, what are you doing there? We're looking for shrimp. Really? You came all the way from Germany to look at these shrimp? They don't understand that. Yeah. They just missed that. And in the nights, of course, checking what we have found. This is Lake Matana. It's a very deep lake. The power meter is similar, 28.7. So around the 80s, right? pH 8.5. And that's why you need the salt that brings all the parameters to the point. And here, again, Tulomelania, this is a native fish. That's a real shrimp eater, I hate him. <laughs> this is the habitat of Caridina holtuisi, Caridina lanceolata, Caridina luai, Tulomelania, different kinds. And this is Otelia mesenterium. It's a water plant. You probably have not seen in the hobby. And these bastards are introduced by some idiots, I must say, and they are eating all our shrimp. Look what they do. All day checking where I can find my next McDonald's shrimp. <laughs> it's not Cichlasoma managuense. I was wrong back then. It's the flower form. And they have lots of them now because they have no enemies, no predators. They're just reproducing like hell, destroying the whole lake. So they get pretty aggressive. They are. Yeah. And this is, for me, what I call natural aquascaping. This is really cool. This was the place where I told you about the crocodile, where I saw the, the, the shadow, and I was like, don't move. But, and this is also the habitat of Caridina, of the, the one on the cover there, the Denali, the red with the white spots. You, you will find it under the roots and under the rocks. And this is how it looks like. 
It's a really beautiful, beautiful shrimp. Caridina Demele. And here you also see the rostrum is kind of long compared. And here is this, this was a special one. This was special colored, not in the lake, rarely they look like that because usually they are red with the bluish white spots and not with big patches, right? Um, but I know that now they bred also some that are blue and white and different kinds of, and this is how you find them, but they are very shy. If you lift the rocks, they are gone in a second. They're very shy. And here more of the natural aquascaping. And these little plants there, uh, they're also not in the hobby. There's a lot of new interesting stuff there. I will show some. Another Caridina, Caridina Hultuizi, also Caridina Hultuizi, another Caridina Hultuizi, and another one. <laughs> All Caridina Hultuizi, also here. And again, this is the habitat, and you find them under uh, the leaves. They're hiding. Another plant that could be interesting for the hobby, it's Otelia. And what was interesting here, here a river came in. The temperature was eight degrees lower than the temperature in the lake. And you see the difference? No plants? A lot of plants. This plant is like this. It's like two feet, right? And this is the little shrimp eater, it's like this size. Bastard. <laughs> and these plants, Eriocaulon, you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows exactly what it is. There's no expert on Eriocaulon. We try to find out, but the genus is the closest we can get. A little sea monster. These are the open white places in the lake. And of course, it was sponsored by Denele. This is Lake Tovuti. It's not too far from Lake Poso, it's just, and this is how they catch shrimps, to sell them for, for our markets. Daddy is in the boat smoking and the kids have to work. <laughs> hmm? This is how it goes. This is, and actually I found this guy now on Facebook, he wrote me, Aspar is his name, and he's still doing that. And this back then, he was not on Facebook and nothing, but now even in Sulawesi they have Facebook. This scares me. <laughs> in Papua as well, but I will tell you about Papua later. So this is you see the shrimps stay attached to the rock on the under part and they just swipe them in the in the net. And this is how they collect them. I tried to do that, I was always floating. Probably too much uh, <laughs> mass here. I, these guys I, I wondered how they stay and I was struggling to go down even. I was like no I'm floating. This is the result of like 20 minutes catch, or even not 20 minutes. You have in there, and this is Papi, who's sitting there smoking and having a relaxed day, and the kids working. What a no, that's not. Otherwise, we have to put always beep, beep, beep. Caridina spinata, Votaleke, Glaubrechti, and some other species more. And also, yeah, this is Profundicola. And this is how they keep them. And half of them are dead already in these, because they put green leaves in there. I mean, huh? they just break it from the tree, put it inside, and that don't help. And then half of them, Candina Voltereke, die before they are even shipped to Jakarta. And from Jakarta they go then, and to total different water, they go to Germany, to France, or to US, or wherever, and half of them die again. So it's a bit of a problem. I try to explain these guys. Mm -hmm. Please change your ways, because we don't want to have the shrimps harmed so much, but they always say, well, we go to the lake, we catch new ones. Yeah. <laughs> lake Tovuti underwater. Wow. They look like candy, right? <laughs> this is Carlina Voltareke. I told you about that before. Have you ever seen, who knows this shrimp? Never seen that? It's a freshwater shrimp. And they have just six to eight, maximum ten eggs. 
so they don't root reproduce like the rabbits. They go very slow. You know this one? Cardina spinata. And this is another of the morphological features, how you distinguish between the species. You have here the spines on the telson. On the uh, fan, tail fan, and the rostrum, of course. The rostrum is called, this is the nose, that's called the rostrum of the shrimp. And you can see how long the. Okay. And usually they are broke here or broke here. That shows that probably too many came in the back and they broke their um, uh, antennas. Antennas, yeah. So this is a sign that this guy that I brought from Sulawesi myself was in a good condition. A new species from Lake Tabuti. Wow. Ever seen this one? Well, good that I showed you Sulawesi, something new for you today, huh? <coughs> Caridina Luai from Luai Island. Caridina Profundicola. That almost looks like a chameleon. Yeah, and also long rostrum. Masapi, Glaubrechti, Caridina Glaubrechti. This is also Caridina Glaubrechti. And here you can see these guys carry more eggs and have a long rostrum as well. And here you can count the teeth or the thorns or how you want to call them. We call them spines when we work with them scientifically, with crayfish or with shrimp. This is a picture and you see the first one's dead already here, but here Spinata, um, Voltareke, also Voltareke here. Probably Luai. This is this is Luai for sure. This is Profundicola. This is the one with the yellow bands. So uh, a total mix and all in the same spot. And now you wonder that they don't mix, even if they are genetically very close. Mm. And this is the place where the big uh, crocodiles live, <laughs> but have some beautiful plants there. See, this is a real beautiful water plant there. Who knows the plant? Who is, the, who is the plant expert here? Walter, Tyler, Tyler, Travis. Travis. I'm going to point at somebody else. Travis. <laughs> <laughs> tell, me, tell me what the plant is. Can't see it. Well, okay, let's skip. Mm -hmm. What is it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never said that I know. <laughs> My plant guys, that, that uh, Stefan Hummel, who wrote with me the plant guide, uh, he knows that. But for me, that plant was. It's not a plant that you find regularly in the, it's not a Valisneria or a Sagittaria or whatever. But this is how, how the lake looks underwater. Here you have the mesenterium and some amazing waterfall. And here, this was covered with moss. All, all the, and this, you are tiny like this. Huh? And amazing, one of the, in most incredible spots. And you have snails there, of course. Tilomelania perfecta. And this is also a typical habitat of uh, crocodiles. And you find there's <coughs> species in the river and in the lakes. Usually there are different <coughs> species there. And a lot of crabs there. And in the river, I found even a new genus. And I described this with my friend Peter Ng from Raffles Museum in Singapore. And it's a tiny crab, it's like that. That is the size of this crab. Then you have this one. It's uh, named after the company JBL in Germany. Caridina Bömi, the, the guy who invented the company. And of course, a lot of Tilo Milano, all different kinds, colors. I call this a Torero snail. You see, so many different ones and most of them are colorful or interesting pattern and this looks like a snail cemetery you see all dead ones but over the thousands of thousands of years of course uh, 